what we want to talk about tonight is Jesus Christ, and not just as a dead hero of the past, but as our living Lord, someone who continues to have a relationship with us, although we cannot see him, he's invisible. We see him in the sacraments of the church, we certainly see him in one another, but uh, he is risen, he is alive, he is with us. Um, but knowing the historical Jesus, Jesus who walked here on earth, gives us insights, correct insights into the true nature of Jesus Christ and what he truly is like. Now, the problem is, throughout the history of the church, even in the early years of the church, after the, the resurrection of Christ, after his ascension into heaven, Christians began to muddy the waters in terms of his true identity. Not the church per se, but members of the church. The church's leadership, meaning the apostles themselves, their successors, uh, when they came together uh, to decide something about the nature of Jesus, the nature of God, we believe the Holy Spirit guided them. But sometimes they had to come together because there were controversies that were developing about the true nature of Jesus that were leading people astray. So I'd like to go over uh, four or five early church heresies. A heresy is uh, something that is not true, but is believed to be true uh, about Jesus. And one of the early Christian heresies was called Gnosticism. Gnostic is uh, a Greek word, I guess, for, uh, from an English word that comes from the Greek gnosis, meaning knowledge. And there were some Christians in the early church who felt that they themselves had a direct line of knowledge from God that enabled them to have an insight about Jesus Christ and the nature of the church that nobody else knew. Not the Pope of the time, the successor of St. Peter, not any of the bishops. They were, in their minds, uh, given a knowledge that nobody else knew. And then they would share this knowledge with other Christians and form these little Gnostic groups. Now, what are, And they actually started to form their own Gospels. Uh, the Gospel of St. Thomas is a, a Gnostic Gospel. The Gospels that form the movie, uh, what was the name of that movie? Uh, the Da Vinci Code. Uh, <laughs> are from the Gnostic Gospels of that period of time. And the church had to come together in council and say, listen, Gnosticism is a heresy, the Gospel of St. Thomas, these other Gospels that contain all kinds of wild ideas about who Jesus is, these are all uh, heresies, they're false. And one of the tendencies of Gnostics was that they had this direct line from God that inspired them with a particular belief that was very spiritual. And that caused them to um, dislike the physical. And so they felt like the church was kind of an abomination because it used images and uh, water for baptism and said that Jesus Christ was true God and true man. He had a human body. And they didn't like the human body. They thought it was evil. They thought the material world was evil. They thought the world in general was evil. They wanted a purely spiritual experience uh, of Jesus Christ. But they also thought that uh, Jesus in his physical body did some physical things that anybody else would do, that he got married. How many of you watch the Da Vinci Code and uh, the thing is that he married who? Mary. Mary Magdalene. And he had divine children evidently, or had children with Mary Magdalene. Well this was all part of this heretical uh, idea that was developing in the very uh, first centuries of the church. The next uh, heresy was Docetism, and this came from Gnosticism, but it asserted that Christ only appeared to be human, but since the material world is so evil, and the body too, he must have just pretended. Uh, they had no problem with Jesus being divine, but his humanity was a stumbling block for them, and so his humanity to them was just an illusion. God pretending to be human, taking on the form of a human being, but he was completely uh, divine. The next heresy of Arianism developed from uh, a man called Arius, in, in, who lived between 250 A.D. to 336 A.D., and he did the opposite. He denied the divinity of Jesus Christ, which is the opposite of Docetism. 
Jesus was not of the same substance uh, as God the Father, but was created by God to be a human being. He was considered higher than any man, but not equal to God. He was God's adopted son. Uh, and therefore, Arians didn't really believe in the Holy Trinity, that there's one God and three divine persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Then the next heresy that developed was uh, Nestorianism, named after its founder, Nestorius. He said that orthodox teaching or, or right teaching about Jesus, or actually I should say, orthodox teaching or right teaching about Jesus is that he is the second person of the Blessed Trinity. That there is one divine person with two natures, human and divine, and these cannot be separated. Nestorian taught, however, that Jesus was two persons, one divine person and one human person. And that the Blessed Virgin Mary was only the mother of the human Jesus because he separated the two. And that caused the church to kind of have to come back and say, no, the second person of the Blessed Trinity who became incarnate of the Blessed Virgin Mary is one divine person with two natures, human and divine, and that union of human and divine natures is called the hypostatic union, okay? But there's one divine person, therefore we can say that Mary is the mother of God. Not just the mother of the human Jesus, but the mother of God. She gave birth to the divine person, one divine person who has two natures. But an historian didn't want to have anything to do with that understanding uh, of Jesus. He wanted to separate the divinity and the humanity and say that there were two persons uh, in Jesus. Uh, and that Mary was only the mother of the human part of Jesus. God was only the father of the divine part of Jesus. So he, he made a distinction. And that is a heresy of the early church. And the last heresy that I want to cover is uh, monophysis, monophysism. And this centered on the notion that the human nature of Jesus was absorbed into the divine nature. And this caused the church to clarify that the hypostatic union, the human experience and the divine nature, uh, and both of those are one God. Uh, and that in God, he bridged the gap between humans and the divine. So, so I don't know what heresies that you guys are operating from, uh, <laughs> but most of us have questions about Jesus Christ. And we can go off on various tangents based upon what we think is a personal direct line that we have to God that is infallibly... Uh, define for us his true nature and then we go and blab it to everybody else and put everybody else in uh, a, a wrong picture uh, of who Jesus is. Or we can look for the true Jesus as scriptures understand Jesus to be and as the church understands, which means a little bit of humility. You know, there's a tendency, I think, in the Christian world to, today for preachers like me or uh, other priests or even evangelical preachers in the Protestant tradition or just any Christian to say, well, this is what I believe. And then they'll go on and tell you this fantastic thing. But because the preacher prefaced it by saying, this is what I believe, well, it's got to be correct. Because I believe it, meaning I have some direct knowledge. Gosh, he believes that, so it must be true. My question is, what criteria do we use to judge what is correct teaching and what is false teaching? What is orthodox, which means right teaching, and what is heretical uh, or false teaching? Just because somebody believes something and just because somebody believes they have a direct infusion of knowledge from the Holy Spirit does not make it true. Uh, you have to have a higher level of critique and a higher source to judge what is true and not true about Jesus, the Most Holy Trinity, the nature of the church, the nature of who we are. Just because we believe something, because somebody told us something, doesn't make it true. And none of us uh, is infallible uh, when it comes to uh, things spiritual. We have to uh, um, turn it over to a higher authority. Now, the most important thing that we learn from the New Testament is that the people that Jesus called to surround him, first of all, his 12 apostles, but he had other disciples that were not as in close relationship with him and other followers, is that he is personal. He is relational. 
Jesus wants people to be a part of him. So Jesus has affected the lives of billions of people in the last 2,000 years. And through the church, people have gotten to know him personally as a real person because God wants to be known, wants to be loved, and wants to be served. He wants us to know, love, and serve him because he knows, loves, and serves us, especially in Jesus Christ. So we have to make sure that the Jesus we get to know and love personally is the Jesus that the New Testament tells us about, as well as sacred tradition. Now, as you know, the New Testament consists of 27 books compiled by the early Christian believers. After the death and resurrection of Jesus, it took nearly 100 years to develop the writings of the New Testament and another 200 years for the church to determine what would be classified as the New Testament. And as we know, the New Testament is broken down into four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Acts of the Apostles, which is an extension of the, the Gospel of Luke, the 21 letters, mostly written by St. Paul, challenging, correcting, guiding, and encouraging new Christian communities to hold to their new beliefs. Then there are other letters attributed to St. Peter, to St. James, and to St. John. And then finally, there's the highly symbolic uh, book called the Book of Revelations, or the Book of the Apocalypse. Now, the four Gospels, as we already have learned, gradually developed. The first stage of the gospel development is actually what took place in the life of Jesus. What do the apostles themselves see? What did the Blessed Virgin Mary know? And, and so in the life of Jesus, we have eyewitnesses to the various things that Jesus said and the various uh, actions that he actually undertook, the miracles that he performed. But prior to his death and res resurrection, it, is my, it could be likely that even Jesus' closest associates did not fully comprehend who Jesus was. Now we know that St. Mark's Gospel is the oldest and the shortest of the Gospels written probably or completed around 19, uh, the year 55 AD. And it portrays the apostles as very dumb, which could be a rather accurate uh, portrayal of them because it's one of the earliest Gospels put to writing. They're not really sure. When you read the Gospel of Mark, when we're reading it, we know who Jesus is. It's clear to us. But when you're reading about the, the apostles, like, uh, it's, it's only, only, they only gradually come to an awareness of who Jesus is. And it's over the, the course of his uh, public ministry. And sometimes, you know, when Jesus makes statements that they should grasp, they don't. They don't comprehend, which tells us that that probably is very true. Now, the second stage uh, of the Gospels is the preaching by the evangelists after the resurrection, uh, which is called the oral stage. They initially believed that Jesus would return immediately, uh, so there was no need to write things down in, the, in a book form. And so you would have preachers, the apostles themselves, and those who saw Jesus going out to the known world of that time with vivid memories of Jesus, but now they have... 2020 hindsight because of what event? Pardon? The resurrection. Made all things clear. Prior to the resurrection, even up until the death of Jesus, you know, St. Peter denies him three times. Uh, Judas uh, betrays him because there was some disillusionment developing during his public ministry in terms of who they thought he was, and they were becoming disillusioned because he wasn't doing what they wanted him to do. But after the resurrection, all things were made clear. And sometimes in preaching about uh, walking with Jesus, they act as though uh, they knew it all along, when in fact they really didn't have this 2020 hindsight until after the resurrection. So it's like, um, what would be an example of today? Um, the miners that were just rescued, the 33 miners. Well, uh, let's say uh, the president of, of Chile, uh, um, we know that probably when the miners got trapped, he was probably very worried and thought that maybe he, they would all die, okay? But then through uh, technology and hard work and all, they drilled a hole, and now they're back on the surface and alive and well. And I'm sure that in his memoirs, uh, the president of Chile will probably say, well, I knew all along that these men would be saved, okay? 
Well, he probably didn't know all along, but now that they are saved, it gives him a different perspective. Uh, and that's the, tr the, the, the same thing is true about the resurrection. It changes uh, um, the perspective of the apostles and also helps them to adjust their own personal history to the truth uh, prior to the resurrection as they preach it. Then the third stage of the gospel development is the actual writing down of the oral tradition in a book form with a particular theology of what occurred. And this writing uh, is done by an editor. As I mentioned, the oldest gospel is St. Mark that was written around 55 AD. Matthew and Luke are very similar. They have some similar stories, although if you look at Matthew's uh, nativity scene, uh, or, or narrative, and Luke's nativity narrative, they're very different. Uh, and some say, well, maybe Luke just uh, captured one part of it, and Matthew did another part, and maybe we need to put them together. But when you read the Gospels, you have to read them independently, because each of them has its own theology that they're trying to present about the true nature uh, of Jesus. And those two Gospels were written around 65 to 70 AD, and they're more sophisticated and more developed than St. Mark's Gospel, and the apostles themselves come off looking very smart all along during Jesus' ministry. Then the final Gospel, St. John, is written about 100 AD, and it's the most sophisticated, and because there's been more time for the early church to reflect upon the true nature of Jesus and to put it into a written form. So much so that St. John's Gospel, in its prologue, can say that in the beginning there was God, uh, and in the beginning was the Word of God, and the Word of God became flesh. Well, Mark's Gospel could never say that uh, some 50 years earlier, because they had, the early Christian community had not reflected on that aspect of the second person of the Blessed Trinity that St. John's Gospel has. Now, in the development of the four Gospels and all of Scripture, the work of the Holy Spirit is there from the beginning to the time that it's put into writing and accepted into the canon of the church. So we cannot leave out the guidance of the Holy Spirit in helping the Christian community to put the four Gospels together and to ultimately determine what would be the books uh, of the New Testament. So the most important thing is that through the eyes of faith, based on the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, a new understanding of Jesus' life developed that the apostles may not have had uh, if the resurrection had not occurred. So, so let's say that Jesus just simply died and there was no resurrection. Well, first of all, we wouldn't have the four Gospels because there would be no point. But if they decided to write a history of Jesus, it would have been much different than the four Gospels. The four Gospels are written from the perspective of belief that Jesus is God, he's the risen Lord, he's still present, and they try to give us a testimony of what our faith should be, not in a dead hero that lived in the past, but in the Lord that is still with us. Does everybody understand that? So the, there's a, the, the Gospels are not meant to be biographies of Jesus, although there's biographical material. They're meant to be faith documents of what and who Jesus is, what he's accomplished, and who we are in relationship to him. So the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is what motivates us to understand who Jesus is. And based on that, we start looking at other events in the life of Jesus and interpret them in the light of the resurrection. So prior to um, the resurrection of Jesus, if an apostle was thinking back to the birth of Jesus, they probably would have understood it differently prior to the resurrection than they would after the resurrection. So Matthew and Luke bring a post-resurrection understanding to the nativity. Uh, and make it clear that, well, when he was born, he was the Son of God. But actually, when you look at the various aspects of the life of Jesus, it probably started closer to his death and resurrection that they were trying to figure out, well, when did we actually realize that he was the Son of God? And they worked backward in time until St. John's Gospel that says, well, we knew all along, you know, he was God even before he was born. So let us... Uh, with the eyes of the resurrection, look at the birth of Jesus. The gospel relates to us that Mary was chosen by God to be the mother of his son and that the, this message was communicated to her through the angel Gabriel in what is called the Annunciation. The angel Gabriel announces to the Blessed Virgin Mary that she is to conceive Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. So from a biological point of view, 
this is miraculous. It's not your normal, ordinary conception by uh, mom and pop here. This is a unique conception that is miraculous. There is no human father. There is no human sperm. Yet a biological conception takes place. God is the father of Jesus. God the father. The Blessed Virgin Mary is the mother of Jesus. And she has conceived in a supernatural way not in the uh, normal way of nature. Therefore, from Mary, Jesus as God takes on or inherits our human nature, yet remains God. Jesus is divine and human. He's one divine person, as I mentioned, with two natures. He's not two divine persons. He's one divine person, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, with two natures, a human nature and a divine nature. So that should lead us to this question, what then is the Immaculate Conception? Well, if you listen to TV shows that might make fun of the Catholic Church or some aspect of somebody getting pregnant or whatever, uh, you'll hear them say, well, this is the Immaculate Conception. That's not what the Immaculate Conception is. And the Immaculate Conception does not refer to how Jesus was conceived in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary. The Immaculate Conception refers to how Mary was conceived in the womb of her mother, St. Anne, through a natural intercourse by her father, who would have been St. Joachim. And at the moment of her conception, a normal way that it occurred, uh, as it happens with any of us, God preserved the Blessed Virgin Mary and chose her from all eternity to be the mother of his son. He preserved her from original sin. That is what the uh, Immaculate Conception is. The Virgin Conception, on the other hand, refers to how Jesus is conceived within the womb of his mother, the Blessed Mother, the Blessed Virgin Mary. Through a miraculous occurrence by the power of the Holy Spirit, he becomes incarnate of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Incarnate not meaning reincarnation, but incarnate mean, meaning God took on flesh through the Blessed Virgin Mary. Now, Catholic teaching it's very clear that the Blessed Virgin Mary remained ever virgin. She never had sexual intercourse with St. Joseph, nor did she have any other biological children. She, the only child that she ever gave birth to was Jesus Christ, and she remained a virgin throughout her life. Now, some of you will say, well, in the scriptures it said that Jesus Christ had brothers and sisters, and it does. The Catholic Church, from the very beginning, as well as the Orthodox churches, uh, like the Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, all the rest of them, have always understood uh, the additional brothers and sisters of Jesus from a number of points of view. Nothing is uh, in concrete that this is historically correct. It's options that are available to us. Some believe that St. Joseph was an older man and could have been married prior to being uh, betrothed to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Blessed Virgin Mary was a young uh, woman, a teenager, when he actually was betrothed to her and she was found to be with child. He could have had other children, so his children, by any other previous marriage, would have been considered brothers and sisters to Jesus because of the family unit that uh, Mary and Joseph created in their home. So that's one explanation for the scripture saying that uh, he had brothers and sisters. If you understand the nature of family in the Middle East of that period of time, it also believed that extended family members, aunts and uncles, first cousins and second cousins, if they lived under the same household and supported one another, under the same roof but in the same household, cousins would have been considered brothers and sisters as well. Okay. Uh, so we could say that uh, Jesus had brothers and sisters in the broader extended family. We can also say, because the scriptures make this very clear, there's a point in Jesus ministering the Gospels where uh, he's in a crowd and somebody yells out, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts that nursed you. And Jesus says, Blessed... Uh, uh, is the one who hears the word of God and keeps it. That person is brother and sister and mother to me. 
So anyone who hears the word of God and keeps it and follows Jesus, we're brothers and sisters of Jesus. So he has all kinds of brothers and sisters from that perspective. But the point I'm making in all of this is that the Catholic Church teaches that Jesus had, that the Blessed Virgin Mary had no additional children and that Jesus had no other biological brothers and sisters. Okay? Now the Gnostics thought that he did. Okay? Uh, and that's part of what the Da Vinci Code is on, that he not only had brothers and sisters, but he also had uh, children. Well, that's, that's heretical. So is there any question on, on the church's belief about the Blessed Virgin Mary being conceived without original sin, and that's what's called the Immaculate Conception, but that she had a normal conception, as any of us would. It's just at the moment of her conception, God preserved her uh, from inheriting original sin. And that secondly, Mary conceived Jesus in a miraculous way and had a virgin conception and a virgin birth. And that she remained perpetually virgin. She never had sexual intercourse with St. Joseph, even in marriage, and uh, had no other children. So does that, is that a stumbling block for anybody that's coming from a more Protestant tradition, which does kind of say, well, the Mary probably did have other children. It's not a problem for a lot of Protestants to think that she did have other children. But in Catholic teaching, it's defined dogma that she was a perpetually virgin uh, throughout her life, ever virgin. So does everybody understand that? Okay. And, and part of that is that the Blessed Mother is viewed as being not only the mother of Jesus, but the mother of the church, and also the spouse of the Holy Spirit. In a sense, her true husband is the Holy Spirit that brought about the conception in her womb and that she was always faithful to God. So she didn't have a, a physical, sexual relationship with anyone else because her relationship was a spousal one with God. Uh, so she was never unfaithful to that. So that's kind of a very important concept within Catholicism as well. And the church... Uh, Mary is also a symbol of what the nature of the church, that the church is the bride of Christ uh, and is called to have a, a um, unique relationship with Christ who is the groom. So the Gospels make clear that Jesus came not only to fulfill the hope of the Jews of the Old Testament, but that he was also the Messiah for all people, even those who were not Jews. And when you look at the infancy narratives, uh, the, the birth narratives in Matthew and, and Luke, uh, and I think it's Luke that has the, the infancy narratives concerning the three magi. Who were the magi? In fact, the, if you read the Gospels, it doesn't even tell you how many there are. It's tradition that has told us uh, how many there were and what their names were. Was it uh, Baltazar, Melchior, and... Gaspar, okay, but that, you, this, those names are not in the scriptures, those, that's from uh, tradition. And, and if you read this, the scripture narrative about the Magi or the astrologers, uh, it, it doesn't indicate the number. But anyway, what's, what is the religion of the astrologers? They're pagan. They're, they're, they worship uh, uh, the stars, uh, and they plot the stars out, in fact, their own religion leads them to Jesus Christ by the way of a star. So God can use a false religion to lead people to the truth, okay? Uh, that's an important appreciation of a false religion, that there are some elements that contain truth in it. So these astrologers who are not Jews come to Jesus by way of a star, but that before they go to the nativity scene or where Jesus is in Bethlehem, they have to go to the Jewish authorities and find out from them if they are expecting a miraculous birth. And they open up their Old Testament and say, yes, the Old Testament predicts that the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem of Judea. So that confirms for them that the Old Testament is right. Uh, and then they go and they offer worship to Jesus. And that's supposed to show us and teach us that the message of Jesus Christ is not just for the Jews, but it's for all of humanity. And that would have been radical in the time of Jesus because the Jews would have thought that their Messiah was just for them uh, because they're the chosen people. But over the course of time, when you look at the ministry of Jesus, you'll see that his ministry is not just to Jews, but it's to uh, the dispersed people of God 
and to all people. So he is a universal Messiah. So the most important message of the birth of Jesus is that God has become one of us. He is like us in all things but sin, but he is still God. <clears throat> God understands human beings and our world, uh, and he sees human beings and the world not as inherently evil and in need of destruction, but good. And what does St. John's Gospel tell us? Uh, God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son not to condemn the world, but to save the world. So that should give all of us hope because when we look into our own hearts, we see that we're a mixed bag of good and evil. And our belief is that God loves us despite the evil that we might do or the dark side that we might have. And that he has been sent to us to redeem us, not to condemn us. Because I think so many Christians have this idea that God is just waiting for us to slip up and... Uh, fall into some sort of horrible sin so he can smite us and send us to hell. But the whole ministry of Jesus is rather to uh, reach out to the sinner, pick him up, and redeem him over the course of a period of time as that person makes their pilgrimage through this life. So what's important for us to understand is that God loves us unconditionally. Now after the birth of Jesus and up until he was about 12 years old, we really have very little information about him. Uh, the Gospels tell us that Jesus grew in wisdom and knowledge, which tells us that in terms of his humanity, he was able to learn. Uh, although as God, he knew all things. So perhaps in a sense that, that God limited his uh, um, knowledge within the historical person of Jesus so that he could grow in wisdom and knowledge. And the Blessed Mother had to teach him. I presume how to cook and fend for himself. St. Joseph maybe taught him how to be a carpenter. Uh, so Jesus was, was uh, forming in, those early age, uh, in his early age. Uh, the only thing that we, we really know is that at a certain point, when he was maybe seven or eight years old, he didn't join the family as they departed this particular place and they were worried about him, thought he had uh, been lost, and they go searching for him and they find him in the temple teaching. And that reveals to them something significant about this son of theirs. Uh, so that's an important aspect as well, as well. Finally, when Jesus turns about 30, we begin to get more details about his public life because that's when he begins his public ministry. And his public ministry begins with the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan. And one of the signs of that baptism is that the voice of God is heard to say, when John the Baptist baptizes Jesus, this is my beloved son, listen to him. This is my beloved son, listen to him. Now, can you imagine those, St. John the Baptist and the crowd that must have been around them at that time, what they must have thought at this miraculous occurrence, that, that uh, this is my beloved son. Now, they may have understood if, that this was miraculous, but they might have understood a son of God as anyone being a son of God. We're all children of God, right? Sons and daughters of God. So when they heard Son of God, they may have understood it in the sense of that we're all children of God. But after the resurrection, their understanding of what God said at the baptism was clarified for them. Does that make sense? So when you read the Gospels, you read it as a post-resurrection account where they understand, no, he's not just like us, that we're all children of God and sons and daughters of God. No, he is the Son of God, you know, uh, just as he is the Son of God at his birth. Uh, not just a, a phantom or, or a, a, a spiritual adoption, if you will. So God makes clear that Jesus is his Son and identifies him as such. Then Jesus uh, uh, leaves his private, obscure life and he enters the public arena. We know that Jesus also chose special followers. Jesus gathered around himself fishermen, tax collectors, known sinners. He was not afraid to associate with those who were considered unclean or less than pure. And that's very significant that Jesus would reach out and associate, especially the 12 apostles, they were fishermen who probably didn't have much of a formal education of any kind, and yet he would choose them to be his closest associates and to do what he did uh, once he commissions them to go into the world and preach the good news. So it tells us something significant about Jesus' concern for the lowly, 
the uneducated, the poor, the outcast, the marginalized, uh, those that the religious culture of his day would have excluded and thought not worthy of bothering with. But the whole point of Jesus' ministry is to reach out to those that the world thinks not worthy of bothering with and to bring them into the kingdom of God. So there's a reversal of values. The first shall be last and the last shall be first. And that's, you see that time and time again throughout the, the ministry of Jesus. So what Jesus does also is to perform miracles. He calmed the seas, he healed the paralyzed, he raised dead people back to life, he changed water into wine, and these were all ways in which we as readers or listeners of the Gospels have an assurance that Jesus is God. Because I'm going to tell you something. If Jesus is just a dead hero, just a mere moral human being that did some good things and was you know, a good philosopher, a good teacher, and maybe he was a wonder worker and all the rest of that, if he is not God, I'm leaving the Catholic Church. I'm not going to be a priest and put up with this kind of stuff. You know, he's got to be a little bit more to me than just uh, a, a fancy dude that was able to have a historical impact on people in his time and period. Okay. Uh, you know, I like Martin Luther King, but I'm not going to worship him. I like uh, uh, um, Alexander Graham Bell because uh, what he did led to uh, my Blackberry, but I'm not going to worship him, you know. <laughs> so, so, so what I'm saying is the Gospels are important for people who worship Jesus because you shouldn't worship Jesus if he is not God. Uh, so so uh, the whole point is the heresies that I pointed out at the beginning they diminish the divinity or, or the true nature of Jesus. And I'm thinking, well, why the heck follow him if, if this is what you want to believe about him? Uh, uh, so the church has to have a very clear and concise understanding of Jesus being worthy of worship because he's God. The only one that is worthy of worship is God. And the miracles and all the other things that Jesus does uh, points to that. But apart from the more spectacular things that Jesus did in terms of miracles, uh, for example, uh, changing water into wine, raising uh, Lazarus from the dead, uh, raising uh, Jairus' daughter from the dead, and the other really spectacular things that he did. And those were very powerful signs. The most powerful sign that Jesus is God is something that probably we would take for granted and not even think as a very powerful sign. Does anybody know what that is? Forgiveness. The forgiveness of sins. Because in the Jews' mind of that day, who was the only one that could forgive sins? God. So when Jesus forgives sins, there's two responses to the Jew that could come from the Jews. He's nuts, okay? He's a heretic. He blasphemes. Or he's God. So he's either lying and acting as a, a, a betrayal to the religion of Israel and putting himself in the place of God, or he is who he says he is by the actions that he performs. Because what's implied is, if he forgives sins, he's God. Correct? And you make your decision on that. And in the Jews of Jesus' day, some were split right down the middle. Some thought, we're going to put this man to death. He, he is uh, uh, betraying the religion of Judaism. And then you have others who are saying, this man is God. But it's coupled with the miracles that he performs. Because isn't healing and forgiveness related? Uh, so they had both together, and that gave them an insight into the uh, true nature of Jesus. Jesus also proclaimed a new message for all God's people. God's kingdom is already in the here and now here on earth. And it begins with the public ministry of Jesus, or begins with the, the birth of Jesus, actually his conception. And it awaits its fulfillment. So Catholics believe that the kingdom of God is on earth already, but it has not completely been fully realized and won't be fully realized until the Lord returns at the end of time. So we're in that period. You know, the Jews were in the period of waiting for the Messiah to come, and he did in the birth of Christ. And he had his public ministry and ushered in a new era of his kingdom through his death and resurrection. And now we're waiting, like the Jews of old, for his second coming and the completion of salvation history. Okay? We don't know when the second coming is going to come or come about, and we can't really, shouldn't be predicting uh, when that will take place. But Catholics do believe in the second coming and the conclusion of this world as we know it, 
or the fulfillment of the salvation of the world as Jesus intended, which I think is a more positive way to look at it, right? There are some people who say that when Jesus returns, he comes to destroy uh, everything, but the Catholic teaching is he comes to fulfill and complete his redemption uh, and to judge the living and the dead. So um, for us, it's a more positive thing, although in my own mind, I don't mind it. Jesus postponing the return. I don't know why that it is, because we're all afraid of change, right? Uh, and we're not exactly sure what will happen at the second coming, but it will be a major uh, change in, in uh, the manner in which this world will be operating, but our belief is for the much, much better. Now, with that in mind, Catholics and most traditional Protestant denominations do not believe in the rapture. Okay. I don't know what your own perspective is on the rapture, and I'm not the right one to explain it completely, but uh, from what I understand from, reading the, from Christians reading wrongly and interpreting wrongly the book of Revelation, there is a belief that in the end times, which a lot of Christians believe we're in, but we are in the end times because we're waiting for the, the Lord to return, that there will be a period of time when those who have been faithful to God will disappear from earth, okay? They're raptured into uh, heaven, correct? Is that, am I explaining that right, Buck? They go, so their things are left behind, <laughs> but they're gone. So those who remain are the ones that will suffer the tribulation, okay? Until the Lord returns. That is not Catholic teaching. It's not Methodist teaching. It's not Episcopalian teaching. It's not Presbyterian teaching. It is a teaching that developed in the 1920s by a group of Protestant Christians called fundamentalists. So it only has, what, uh, a 90-year history right now. Uh, the rapture is, is a heresy uh, that has some Gnosticism in it that people believe that they have an insight that no other Christian church, including the Catholic Church, has about the nature of the end of the world and uh, that uh, somehow those that are left behind are the unfaithful ones. Uh, and guess who will be the primary ones left behind in the fundamentalist view of the rapture? Yeah. Catholics. Woo. So just imagine you're becoming Catholics and you're going to be left behind when the rapture occurs. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so that is a, a, a heresy of the church. It, it, it is not something that is believed, as I mentioned, by Catholics, Orthodox, Episcopalians, Lutherans, whatever. It's a recent phenomenon. So God desires an intimate relationship with his people. We can call God Abba, Jesus tells us that, which means Daddy. That's pretty intimate, you know. I don't know if the Jews would have even understood God's relationship to us as being as intimate as that. And we're called to love God and our neighbor as ourselves. Then, uh, towards the end of his ministry, Jesus is arrested because the religious authorities are conspiring against him because he's acting like God. He thinks he's God, and people think he's God. And the, Jew, the uh, secular authorities, the Roman Empire, is worried that he thinks he's a messiah in the sense of a political messiah to overthrow the Roman government. So you have two forces, powerful forces, acting against Jesus because they both, uh, 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 one believes correctly <laughs> that Jesus, not correctly, believes that Jesus is delusional, and the other one believes that Jesus is Messiah and a threat to their political authority. And so uh, he's put on trial, he's put to death, but three days later he rises again. So the church understands suffering to be embraced as a good when we unite our sufferings to Jesus. So after Jesus' suffering and his crucifixion, three days later he is raised, and all of us who uh, give our sins to Jesus, suffer and die with him as well, and will be raised with him as well. So Jesus Christ is Lord, and we must accept him as such. So, as I mentioned in Catholic teaching, we are saved by what God does for us, and that he accepts us in Jesus Christ. But the second part of that is that we still have free will, and we have to participate in receiving the gift of Jesus, accepting him into our life, and participating in his ministry through the church. So you really can't, what's important about Catholicism is you can't separate the church from Jesus. Whereas a lot of Protestants will say, 
independently of the church you would accept Jesus Christ, and then you should go and find a church. Have you ever heard that? Okay, well, if you are accepting Jesus Christ, it's because the church has preserved his message, and somehow it's been communicated to you because the church has preserved the message, but you can't really separate Christ from the church. That's kind of a, a, a dualism, just as you can't separate Christ from his humanity or divinity. Uh, uh, it's all one package deal. So Jesus is the second person of the Blessed Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Before becoming human, Jesus was God's Word. He was always there from the beginning uh, as God's Word. But in time and place, He became human. The Word was made flesh through the Blessed Virgin Mary. But Jesus was also human. He had bodily functions. He had feelings, emotions. He worried. He had anxiety about His crucifixion. Uh, he sweat blood over it. Uh, so, so he did have real human uh, tendencies. He could learn. He could grow tired. He was hungry. He was weak. Yet he is still the divine person of uh, uh, the one divine person. So he never sinned. Now the question is, what did Jesus know about his divinity during his public life? And this is controversial in the Catholic Church because there's a variety of schools of thought about that. Now let me make clear that after the resurrection, Jesus knows who he is, okay? Uh, he is God, so he, there's no question about what he knows uh, after, in the risen state. But let's say from the moment of the birth until his death on the cross, is it possible because he did take on human nature that Jesus himself grew in his awareness of who he was. So much so that towards the, the, the trial, and then certainly in the Passion, he's very much cognizant of that, but he may not have been in his private life when he was a child, or maybe early on when he uh, um, was baptized by John in the Jordan, because maybe the voice from heaven was to alert Jesus to his true identity, not just everybody else. Do you think that takes away from Jesus? Anybody? Or maybe uh, his, it was necessary for his parents, his mother in particular, to say, you know, you were conceived in a unique fashion. Um, and that kind of helped him to understand his identity. Yes? I thought Jesus, when he was like, what, seven, eight years old, or whenever he disappeared into the uh, synagogue, mm -hmm. Right, right, right. right. But certainly, know. certainly. Uh, but did he know fully that he was God at that point? But didn't he give up the mountain one time with the three disciples? Yes, now he would have been an adult at that period. And, and that might have been for his benefit too. You know, going to the, the transfiguration may have been to bring an awareness to the human part of Christ of his true nature, as well as to make it clear to Peter, James, and John. So, you, so, so when he goes up to the mountain, he has to come down, but he faces it with a new attitude as he goes to uh, Jerusalem, and he's fearless in that regard. So this is conjecture on our part. We, I, that's not, this, what I'm telling you is not infallibly determined by the church, because when I was growing up, the Baltimore Catechism taught that Jesus knew everything from the moment of his birth. There was no uh, question about anything. He knew his humanity, he knew his divinity. He, was, he knew everything. And as God, he would. The question is, is it legitimate to say that in that period of time from his uh, conception or his birth to his resurrection, did he himself have to grow in the awareness of who he was? And certainly by the time that he's going to the cross, he knows full well what the outcome is going to be. But there's still some anxiety there, okay? So maybe there's still a little doubt until the resurrection. But after the resurrection, then there's, you know, he's not going to grow any further. I mean, he, he, he has But what all. I've just explained to you is up for debate. So I'm giving you kind of a speculative theology here, but I don't think in any way it calls into question his divinity by speculating about that. Now, some people would speculate on what I just said in order to say he's not divine, okay? But you, I'm not saying that at all. Yes. But being divine as a three-year-old means he is without sin. Correct. He was, and that, that's the constant belief of the church that he never 
did anything that was opposed to God. So the, the divine part of Christ is dealing mainly with the absence of sin. Can, can, no, actually that's not correct. Let me backtrack on that. Okay. We would say that his sinlessness is a sign of humanity fully redeemed. Okay. Uh, so that's not necessarily divine, but makes us God-like. But he still, uh, because the Blessed Virgin Mary was sinless, Catholic belief is that she never committed any sins either. But not because she's divine, because she's fully what God intended humans to be. Okay? Because she was consecrated from the moment of her conception to be faithful to God. And unlike uh, Eve, Adam and Eve, she, even in the face of temptation, never said no to God. So she remains sinless, not as a, a sign of divinity. We don't believe she's divine but as a sign of what human beings are called to be in heaven uh, and what we could have been if Adam and Eve had not sinned with original sin. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, Jerry? I was going to say, Philippians 4 uh, gives us a pretty good idea of what he was thinking. So, excuse me, mind in, in you, which is also in the Lord Jesus, uh, that even though he was by nature God, he did not consider being equal to God a thing to be clung to, but he emptied himself. Uh, becoming obedient unto death, even death on the cross. So I think he was aware that he gave it to the Father so that he could be as fully human as he could and received all these things along the way and responded in a human response. Right. Uh, kind of holding down the divine nature. Right, right. He couldn't have been aware of it. Right. Now, that doesn't mean that God couldn't uh, have, the, hum the divinity of Christ couldn't have taken over at any moment and just uh, shine. So, so what, we're, what we are talking about is really speculative, but I don't think it calls into question uh, who Jesus is in any way. Although, when I was little, for me to say this today to somebody in the 50s, they would have said, you're crazy, you're, you're, you're shaking my faith by telling me this. Uh, because we would have had such a lofty understanding of the humanity of Jesus uh, or the divinity. We would have emphasized more the divinity of Jesus than his humanity, and it's not an either or, it's both and. Yes? So are you saying that there is no dogma on the correct answer? Correct. The there is no uh, defined dogma about what Jesus actually knew. The only thing that is defined is that he is truly God. But what he knew in his public life, if you read the scriptures, it seems to indicate that he grew in, in awareness. He had anxiety issues about his death, negotiated with God, you know, to maybe come up with another way to do this. So, so it tells us something that uh, lets us know that, that Jesus, as one of the heresies says, he wasn't just play acting. It wasn't like he was an actor on the stage acting as though he was a human being. He was going through what human beings go through in that period of time prior to the resurrection. Yes. Father, you said like at the Baltimore catechism. Mm -hmm. was, yes. It was from the moment of conception, mm -hmm. Jesus was aware and knew that he was divine. Mm -hmm. So there were other catechisms, there are other catechisms that teach differently? Well, not teach differently, but the Baltimore catechism, in the period in which it was developed, was a period in which the church really did emphasize the divinity of Jesus, which is nothing wrong with that because we worship the risen Lord. So the risen Lord knows everything. But we would have read that back into his life as well uh, to, to shore up our understanding of divinity. So much so that we almost neglected his humanity. Uh, because even in heaven, Jesus is still a divine being, divine person with two natures, human and divine. He has a, a physical body in heaven. He is still, the only way that we can have a physical uh, side of Jesus touch him tangibly is through his his humanity because if not for that God is a pure spirit okay so, so but in heaven the human and divine natures of Jesus uh, persons or, or, or uh, yeah natures of Jesus uh, are this divine one divine person so there's no question in heaven so, but in pre-Vatican II times, we would have emphasized more the divinity than his humanity in terms of his public ministry. You might catch something on what the Baltimore Catechism is. The Baltimore Catechism was a catechism that was used to teach children about what the Catholic Church believes. And it was developed in, I guess, the 1800s, maybe a little bit earlier than that, uh, and used through the 1950s well into the 1960s. And it was a series of books from first grade to high school. And it was a question and answer thing. 
a question was posed and you were supposed to memorize the answer. And that's how I was taught. It was, you, of course, back then, you, memorization was very important in teaching in general, where it's not as much today. Uh, so what it was very good at doing was teaching the basics, the fundamentals of the Catholic faith, but it didn't cause us to reflect too much. You just kind of learned it rotely, but you learned it. So as an adult now, I still know things uh, from the Baltimore Catechism, but there's been a lot more developed in my life in terms of understanding Jesus since that time, but I haven't gotten rid of what the Baltimore Catechism taught me. So one of the questions is, why did God make you? The answer is, and I still remember to this day, God made me to know, love, and serve Jesus Christ in this life and to be happy with him forever in the life to come. That little statement gets me through life. Uh, you know, uh, it's a very good thing to be able to call up. God made me to know, love, and serve Jesus Christ in this life, not to be happy in this life, but to know, love, and serve him in order to be happy in the life to come. So the happiness is in heaven. Uh, so this life is going to entail some unhappiness, some uh, suffering, and all that. So I, in some ways I miss that we don't have the Baltimore Catechism because our children today don't seem to have the basics that they can then uh, build upon. Okay, so we know from the Old Testament that God is a creator, he is a father, that when God speaks, uh, he creates, uh, and he creates through his word, and we get uh, to know who God is by the power of the Spirit. So when we speak of the Holy Trinity, we're not talking about three separate gods. If you, see, if you have a relationship with God the Father, you're also having a relationship with God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. If you're having, a, or if the Son is having a relationship with you, he, Father and Holy Spirit are still having a relationship with you. God is present in all three, fully, in all three of the persons of the Blessed Trinity. Now, one of the metaphors that I've used, I may have used it in here before, to help us to understand the Holy Trinity is one God with three natures, uh, uh, or three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then the Son has two natures, human and divine, and that's the hypostatic union, is water. Water is water is water is water. It's H2O. But you have the liquid form of water that we drink. You have water in the form of steam, which uh, you don't drink, uh, but you can see it, actually. And you have water in the form of it being frozen. Uh, it's all water, correct? But it has a different uh, aspect to it. But if you have steam, you have water fully. If you have uh, ice, you have water fully. If you have uh, liquid, you have water completely. Uh, the same thing is true with the Blessed Trinity. There's one God, three natures. Now the metaphor that I just used has some aspects of it that are not correct in terms of God. Uh, and I'm sure Buck can explain uh, the heresy that I just talked about. Isn't there a heresy about water? Or is that Mark that knows the heresy? Yes, I want to know why. Why is that heretical? <laughs> Modalism. Tell us about the heresy of modalism. Well, oh, you have your Blackberry there. You're looking it up, aren't you? No, just <laughs> right, it is heresy. In any description of God trying to use uh, manufactured things like I just did, falls short. Because God is a mystery that we cannot completely explain or understand. It's, it's something that we have to enter into. And really, when you say water and ice, well, ice, water is present, but not, not steam. So there's, uh, so you really can't say that metaphor is the best thing in the, in, uh, altogether. Yes? Uh, I'm still having difficulty getting my head around the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. what exactly the Holy Spirit is. It is the action of God uh, in the world. Um, unseen, uh, inspiring, transforming, sanctifying us. It's, 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 what, it's a, a, the manner in which God relates to the world. His power to go from himself to us. But he also comes to us by the power of the Holy Spirit in the person of Jesus Christ. And that's how the conception takes place. Uh, and Jesus is divine and human. So, so when Jesus walks here on earth, Father and Son, uh, Father and Holy Spirit were there. All, the Holy Trinity was present when Jesus was here on earth. Um, 
when you, so I think that would be a correct understanding, right? You can't divide the, the Trinity. Uh, it, but Jesus makes the Trinity visible, okay, and tangible. Because in the Old Testament, for you to come into the presence of God and touch him, you would die instantly. But not so with Jesus because he's the mediator between humanity and the awesome transcendence of God, where we can touch God, but through the humanity of Jesus. Uh, so, so there's a, a, a difference of, of, of kind of a buffer, if you will, uh, that enables us to come into the presence of God and see God tangibly in the person of Jesus Christ. Okay. Can I ask another question? Sure. Speaking of the Holy Spirit, you know, the Creed tells us that, that the Holy Spirit was there in the beginning. Yes. Um, and God, and God the, the Word was there in the beginning, too. Yes. So we, we know it was all, all those persons of God were there from mm -hmm. the beginning. But there seems to be, in New Testament times, or during the life of Jesus, there seems to be no awareness in people that the Holy Spirit exists. And when Jesus tells his apostles that he is leaving, but he will send his paraclete, he will send the Holy Spirit, there's a gap of 10 days right. between the ascension and the Pentecost. <clears throat> what was the early church's understanding about where the Holy Spirit was during that 10 days? I don't know that we have any uh, explicit teaching on that, but, but, but certainly the presence of God was there, but not in the specific way that Jesus described uh, the Holy Spirit coming upon the Apostles and the Blessed Virgin Mary. Um, so, so that's a very good question. But if you read the Old Testament, the Holy, the Holy Trinity is implied in the Old Testament. It's not explicit, and it's not explicit in the New Testament. In fact, uh, you can't find the word Holy Trinity in either the Old Testament or the New Testament, but Christians, Protestants, and Catholics believe in the Holy Trinity, although the name Holy Trinity is not there, because it's, it's so implied uh, in both the Old Testament and certainly the New Testament brings it to a higher level. 